The Unsettled Podcast is a presentation of the American South Consortium, a multi-year partnership of the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum of Art, the Columbia Museum of Art, Mobile Museum of Art, and the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts as part of the Art Bridges Cohort Program. This innovative cross-regional partnership explores new ways of interpreting art in the American experience through dynamic exhibitions and an array of complementary public programs. From natural wonders to the open road, the landscape has long been a muse in American art. On view now through April 14th at the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts, the exhibition Unsettled the Landscape in American Art questions the shaping of national identity through objects from the colonial era to the present, exploring the rich, complicated, and evolving topic of what it means to be American. The exhibition presents historic artworks in conversation with modern and contemporary pieces to examine ideas such as defining national identity, the question of land preservation, the meaning of boundaries, the complexity of cultural landscapes, and how locations shape our sense of self. Hi, I'm your host, Drew Barron. I'm the executive producer and content strategist at the Columbia Museum of Art and the producer of the museum's Binder podcast, where we've been sharing stories about the arts for over three years. Today, I'm excited to be hosting the first in a series of specially produced podcasts focused on the exhibition, Unsettled, the Landscape in American Art. On today's episode, we're traveling to Montgomery, Alabama to visit the first stop for this multi-year exhibition. Building upon 19th century Hudson River School paintings, Unsettled features works by artists spanning 200 years of American art history, including Fidelia Bridges, Marsden Hartley, Georgia O'Keeffe, Benny Andrews, William Christian Berry, Anna Mendieta, Ed Ruscha, Jeffrey Gibson, and Jacqueline Bishop. Throughout the series, we will learn more about how artists have interpreted and have been influenced by their surroundings and discuss the evolving conversations around landscape and its relationship to establishing cultural and national identity over the last two centuries. Today, we will meet the curators, educators, and other museum professionals who've come together to bring this new exhibition to life and learn more about their group, the American South Consortium. Let's hit the road. A museum exhibition does not happen on its own. It is a meticulous process that involves the collaborative efforts of curators, museum directors, and various other professionals. They invest years into planning, researching, and designing to craft the unique experiences found within gallery spaces. Unsettled is no different, representing the culmination of extensive work by the four museums who make up the American South Consortium. This multi-regional group emerged with support from the Art Bridges Cohort Program, a unique initiative aiming to change the way museums collaborate by dismantling barriers to collection sharing, resource allocation, exhibition development, and fostering enduring partnerships. Prior to Unsettled, the cohort collaborated on the Spotlight series, a collection of four micro-exhibitions showcasing the narratives behind individual objects from each museum. These exhibitions highlighted the significance of material culture in the history of American art and featured a range of artists, such as craftsman Thomas Day, a fiber artist and quilter Yvonne Wells, sculptor Alexander Calder, and modernist painter Dusty Bonchet. Unsettled now marks the progression of this ongoing partnership into its next phase. Aaron Monroe, Kreebel Curator of American Art at the Wadsworth, tells us how the group got started. I think... I think going back to 2018, 2019, mm-hmm. there was a, essentially a call from Art Bridges saying, would you be interested in a cohort program? And we really onboarded, what does that mean? What does that entail? Yes, there would be funding to support uh, essentially a collaboration amongst other partner museums. Mm. And it was an incredible opportunity because we were able to travel to other museums and sort of introduce ourselves and explore the possibility of something. Really, the the future was not totally clear at that point, but we knew it would be collection sharing of American art and the sky was the limit. Flash forward to now and having a cohort, as it's called, of the Wadsworth with three partner museums was really a great opportunity to work outside of our own region. 
So that was something a little bit new to Art Bridges as well. They had funded cohorts that were within either the same state or within the same geographic region. So being in New England, we noticed that there weren't any partner museums from the South or Southeast. And we, as I said, did some great um, introductory trips and traveled to different museums in the South. And then from a larger list, called down to the total four partners, the three partners we have now. Yeah. I mean, I think there's been a lot of relationship building uh, through this project that it feels like will last well beyond the term of this project. I, I've noticed that there's been a lot more conversation between the curators and the directors about, oh, well, you know, I, I have this piece that you might be interested in learning out in a few years. And, oh, this will work really well with your exhibition coming up. And, and like, I think that's part of what makes this whole process really special, right? Uh, as opposed to, oh, we reached out to this museum. They're going to give us this one painting on yeah. loan. We made a deal this one time and that right. would probably be the end of it. Uh, yeah, we didn't want it to be transactional, right. like this for that or this for that. It was really a combination of personal relationships, professional relationships, expanding curatorial networks um, that will certainly outlast the project. Um, so it's been and it's also been really fun to get to meet new colleagues that otherwise maybe you would never cross paths mm -hmm. or you cross paths at a conference and it doesn't really create a substantial kind of relationship. I mean, it's certainly evolved. Every project that's this kind of big and multifaceted and long term is going to probably change over time. We knew a little bit of what we were getting into. Um, we had some idea of, you know, the ways we could kind of exchange ideas and art and collaborate, but it's just become, you know, even more than I think we expected it to be. Galena Barlow is the curator of education at the Columbia Museum of Art and a collaborator in the consortium. A partnership like this one represents a new way of thinking about how museums can work together to share their collections. Pulling the strengths of various institutions' resources and knowledge to bring new and unique experiences to audiences. Glenna explains. It truly felt like a partnership. Um, going in, we weren't really sure, you know, why all of these Southeastern museums were paired with the Wadsworths, which is a wonderful institution, but it's in Hartford, Connecticut. And it seemed out of place for this, you know, to be the, the American Southern Consortium, which we ended up calling it. Um, but it, you know, we thought maybe it was going to be more of like this larger, you know, institution sharing their collection because they have an incredible and really vast collection. Um, we thought maybe it was just sort of like, a, you know, we, we're borrowing from them and they're just sort of loaning out pieces and, and you know, sharing their expertise. But it really became clear as the project went along that this really was more of a symbiotic kind of relationship. And mm -hmm. everybody came to the table with ideas and art to exchange. And um, it made it a much more uh, meaningful partnership, I think. What I think crystallized for me, especially in this last opportunity we had all to get together, was that it's really that human element that's been so meaningful. Um, we had a lot of Zoom meetings. They're really convenient. And they were a necessity for a while. but. It's really hard to, you know, pencil in, be inspired about this exhibition and have great ideas for like 1.30 on a Tuesday. So um, it was so helpful to actually be with each other and have those opportunities to just talk, um, to share our collections. Um, I, was, I got to be in the room when all of the curators were, you know, sharing the pieces they wanted to include in the exhibition. And you could really see everybody's like pride in their own um, collection. And they really wanted to showcase the pieces that they loved and share them and, you know, tell us why they were so great. Um, and it was wonderful to get to learn from everybody and get to see that kind of enthusiasm. And that's where we also got to have that moment where we, you know, physically were manipulating these pieces and trying to think about how are they going to work together. Creating an exhibition is like solving a puzzle. It involves organizing various elements, ideas, objects, and concepts in a way that forms a coherent narrative. When you assemble a jigsaw puzzle, the first step is to lay out all the pieces on a table. While developing the exhibition layout for Unsettled, the cohort went through a similar process. John Corfagno, the executive director of Mobile Museum of Art, reminisces about how this intricate puzzle finally came together. Well, I remember that uh, moment really directly and that it occurred when we were up in New England at the Wadsworth f &AM. Every one of the institutions had submitted five to ten works 
that they thought would advance the narratives in the exhibition. And we then had a moment where we realized if we just printed out all those different images Mm -hmm. and laid them out on the table, we would begin to see what the themes were and how many works of art we would need in order to tell the different stories. So like we had this mass of images and works of art that we knew were going to somehow fit. And then we had these ideas for categories, but it wasn't until we began placing the works of art in those categories and then replacing them and then replacing them again that the show began to take shape. It was a really interesting journey to move. At one point, we were talking about possibly doing a portrait show, and we had narrowed it down to either portraits or landscapes. And I think landscape was truly the right decision. The American landscape is a potent emblem in art, mirroring transformations within our environment, culture, and society, while articulating the rich topographical tapestry of our nation. Senior curator for the Columbia Museum of Art, Michael Neumeister elaborates. There's a big difference in the way we think about landscape, just as people, just as citizens, Mm -hmm. between the Northeast and the South and the Southwest and the West Coast. I mean, there's just so much to it. It's such an incredible dynamic expanse, which is kind of really ripe, I think, for artistic uh, exploration. Yeah, I mean, I know every time I go to the West Coast, uh, it, I'm always struck by uh, how alien like the flora and fauna feel. Uh, yeah, growing up in like this East Coast, and it's just pine trees, and you know, it's everything right. starts to look very ubiquitous, and you kind of get this idea in your head of like that's the wilderness, that's what the wilderness looks like, and it doesn't look like that when you go out west, you know. Absolutely, and I think that's something that artists picked up on because that is something that was really unique and different, right? Truly, for for artists like. Um, Landscape painting was kind of really famous and popularized by British painters at first. And so American artists, of course, were always looking to Europe and they were looking to their British colleagues uh, for inspiration. Mm. But British landscapes and American landscapes look very different. And that is truly a product of, of place, of, of what we have here that is distinct and unique. Although the exhibition revolves around landscapes, the cohort was intent on broadening this notion beyond the medium of painting. Again, Erin Monroe. Well, certainly there were many conversations uh, between all the partner museums, and it was, it was overwhelming. We each have great strengths in our collections. We each have regional stories we want to tell, and it was not at all um, really restricted by our bridges that it have to be on X, Y, or Z. So. We had open dialogue about what would be meaningful to our audiences and what could we do well with some really strong examples of American art, but Mm -hmm. also introduce some new names. And landscape became flexible enough where we could present some surprising artworks, which I'm really proud to say not everything in the exhibition is an oil painting of the landscape. A little teaser there. But also the idea that we could contribute to the conversation with a common point of entry and then sort of deliver different paths forward um, via the landscape. Unsettled is taking a more holistic perspective around the theme of the American landscape by including objects of material culture, such as furniture, glass, ceramics, and baskets. Again, Glenna Barlow. We really wanted it to feel a little more dynamic and for it to be maybe a little unexpected. So we're thinking about that in terms of materiality and, you know, where does the actual stuff that this artwork is made from come from? And um, just kind of different ways people see the American landscape, what that means to different people and how that is manifested in different kinds of works of art. So we had to think about that. And then there's just like practicality. We had to just, you know, we wanted to highlight uh, the strengths of each museum's collection and kind of showcase them. Uh, but in a way that uh, would make sense when you walked through it. So we had to think about, you know, how are we going to organize this? Because it is really disparate in some ways. You know, you have glass and you have baskets and you have uh, woodwork and paintings, of course. So how are we going to make this all make sense um, when you actually experience it and you walk through it? So we had to think about 
you know, what kind of themes can we tie some of these pieces around that we really want to highlight, but we want to find a smart way to think about how to showcase them and how to make them make sense with other objects. Every artwork in a museum has its own story to tell. And sometimes when works are displayed together in a gallery, a dialogue can happen based around how these stories align with or diverge from one another. Emily Stewart Thomas, head of learning and programs at the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts, tells us how Unsettled is starting new conversations with some of her museum's beloved collection pieces. To see these works together in the gallery, and they're really kind of talking and communicating in a way that is so unexpected. Um, pieces that we know and love from the museum's, you know, Montgomery Museum's permanent collection um, are kind of having different conversations with other works around them, and they're in a new space and um, really looking at them in a kind of completely different way. So yeah. it's very exciting. Yeah. Well, and that's what excites me about this exhibition, this underlying theme that kind of uh, gives uh, voice to these pieces to have a dialogue with one another. Right. And I think that's really interesting. And I bet coming from an education background, it's giving you a lot of fodder for like how you're going to handle these tours and Absolutely. stuff like that. So what have, what have you been thinking about this exhibition? And now that it's about to open, like, how do you see yourself using it from an education perspective? Well, I think what's really exciting is there's the expectation for this to be in like a chronological order. And so kind of what we were touching on is we have very traditional pieces next to contemporary pieces. And so we get to look at them in not just a historical context of this is what was happening at this kind of formal art history, but really that these conversations of identity and self-expression have been going on for so long. And, and we can look at these from different points of view and different perspectives. Um, and I think that's what's really exciting is kind of taking away what people expect to see in a traditional you know, museum exhibition and really, um, like I said, looking at it and reinterpreting it in a new way. One collection of paintings gaining new context in this exhibition are works from the Hudson River School, created by well-known 19th century landscape painters like Thomas Cole or Albert Bierstadt. These pieces serve as a meaningful entry point for the ongoing conversations within Unsettled. Again, Aaron Monroe. It's really a true part of the Wadsworth Athenaeum's collection of American art is a core group of Hudson River School landscapes some of which are um, really incredible in the stories they tell about how they ended up in Hartford. And our name, Wadsworth Athenaeum, uh, it really derives from our founder, Daniel Wadsworth. And he was a major patron of these Hudson River School artists and himself an amateur traveler. So he befriended Thomas Cole and actually had traveled in parts of New England that Cole hadn't been to. So the uh, view in the White Mountains, for example, in the exhibition is a view of New Hampshire that Daniel Wadsworth saw first and wrote a letter to Cole and said, you know, this is incredible scenery. I think you should go paint it. Wow. So it's important to kind of ground the how we got and built this collection. Um, certainly the volume of what we have isn't fully represented in um, Unsettled, but it's a founding point for our museum. And it is a kind of destination collection that people come to see. And it does tell the story of the birth of landscape painting in America, of which Thomas Cole is considered to be the so-called father of the Hudson River School. We now know, and the show aptly reveals that that wasn't only happening in New England, but a lot of these conversations and a lot of these views of America at a very young age were painted in and around the Catskills. Um, thankfully, artists are uh, unsettled. They're on the move. And people like Frederick Church very quickly take that inspiration from people like Cole, but then decide to go further afield and even go outside of what was, you know, the United States at the time. So the historic um, experience of landscape begins with that moment and within that part of our country. And it certainly is a very exciting and aspirational point of view. But the artists making these landscapes were largely white men of privilege, foregrounding um, their visions of progress and potential uh, within the country, which of course was true and, and um, their, their truth, uh, but certainly over time has been revealed to be leaving a lot out of the conversation. 
The artworks of the Hudson River School offer a particular and somewhat limited perspective on the American landscape. Senior curator of the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts, Margaret Lynn Osfeld, is also thinking about this. I think that when you look at some of the traditional academically trained pictures that are, were produced by people like Thomas Cole and Bierstadt, and you think about all that that meant to them when those paintings were painted in the 19th century and what they conveyed about the people who they painted those paintings for mm. and how they perceived those people, their audience, their, the people who bought their work, how they thought about ownership of the landscape and how they saw it as, um, I would say, uh, a resource that they could exploit to, for the benefit of their society. Yeah. And, and you, I, can, I can say that and I can use the word exploit. And that carries a certain meaning now that I don't think it even contained then. They thought they should exploit it. They mm. thought they should. They, that was a God-given gift to them to use this and to take it and to make it, quote, better, unquote, or more right. productive, unquote. Produce food, produce, you know, a livestock, produce, you know, produce something, make product. And they thought of it that way. But in retrospect, when we look at it, we think of all the things that were lost in the process of pushing through to make that product. The values that have, have transformed this country and society are, to me, are reflected in the ways that landscape has been perceived and the way that our different artists are capturing that perception is what makes this show really wonderful. The first section kind of begins with Cole and ends with Andrew Wyeth. And I love the, the thought that these, the medium that Cole was painting in, that oil, brings to the richness and the sort of um, the, lux the luxuriousness yeah. of these beautiful forests and the land and the air and the, you know, the cleanliness of it, right? And the, just sort of you, you put yourself in that environment and you take a deep breath and you think, you know, this is the world as it was first created. This is the way nature is intended to be. And then you glance around and you see the, the steeple, basically, that is the, the Wyatt that carries all the, the meaning that is implied with an architectural element that is like a very vertical, extending up into the sky, kind of like a power symbol in some ways, a mountain, a, a steeple, you know, all of that kind of is a, a call to remember that there is, there is power here in the human expression with architecture that has interrupted what is the, the, in the, in, I'm quoting the innocence of nature, mm. you know, it, mm -hmm. man has come in and he has imprinted himself in this environment and it becomes a, a kind of a conversation to think about, you know, it, it's inevitable. Man has to live on the earth. And as he lives on the earth, he's interacting with nature America and its environment continue to change over the centuries, and artists continue to find new influences in the evolution of the land and what we placed on it. Stan Hackney, curator of art and audience engagement at the Mobile Museum of Art, tells us more. It's ever-changing. The landscape is ever-changing. Yeah. Um, and particularly the way um, maybe contemporary artists are addressing or looking at the landscape with a little more critical lens than maybe um, the kind of Bierstadt Cole Church perfect image, um, which were often not real. I mean, they, they mixed different places that they like to make um, a grander statement. Um, so I love like Bierstadt's work and I love seeing that um, in part because when I was an undergraduate in college and I was fortunate to work at um, the Renaldo House Museum of American Art, they have beautiful Hudson River School and Bierstadt and Cole. And that was kind of my first personal experience with like seeing a, a large major Bierstadt and it was like a wow moment and, and I love that. However, like in this show, um, this Unsettled show, although those are exciting and wonderful, some of the things that 
I gravitate to uh, that I really, really love are like the Jeffrey Gibson, um, which is not like, you know, in a classic term of a landscape, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's an interpretation, but a representation. Um, the other one is like Roger Brown, who, um, again, I love the work. Um, I personally, you know, with the two of them as they, um, uh, are, uh, represent and are out proud gay men, um, uh, that it's, I can relate to, to them in a personal way. I also, uh, have always been a huge fan of Ed Ruscha mm-hmm. and I think the works in this show are really, really interesting. And I really, and I also, I, before I moved to Alabama, I lived in California for a long time. So obviously I love California. So, um, with the Ed Ruscha ones, I find so fascinating because again, I know, I know, I know the geography, I know the topography of the whole thing. And those pieces that are so fascinating, basically where he's overlapping intersections of roads that don't exist. You know, one is a road, road or street or Avenue or whatever in San Francisco. And he intersects it with one in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. which is kind of, it's just very interesting. Um, so people think, okay, this is, this is a real map. It's not a real map. It's, it's kind of in his mind. But as I said, yeah, with the contemporary artists, they're looking at things in a more critical lens. Mm. And, and I think I like that. Like William Christian Berry, I think, is a nice counterpoint almost to the Rudson River School, right? Again, Glenna Barlow. You know, you have this kind of the opposite of the unspoiled landscape. It's like, oh, no, we spoiled it. Um, you know, we, we put stuff in it. Um, and But it's kind of come full circle where it's, you know, now it's these, you know, overgrown billboards or these like houses that are falling apart and like crawling with vines. And nature's kind of reclaiming those spaces. Yeah. And so it kind of brings it, you know, full circle. Um, and yeah, at the same time, we have um, artists like Robert Duncanson were really important to include because he was kind of doing the same thing as the Hudson River School artists at the, at the same time. But it's um, his story is so compelling because he's doing that and he's showing us that there were people out there that didn't fit within, you know, just that small group of elite artists who were trying to do the same things, but he had all these additional obstacles that he had to, you know, deal with on top of, you know, just the challenge of, of trying to make art, which is already a hard thing. Duncanson, an African-American artist working before and during the Civil War in the United States, employed a stylistic approach reminiscent of the Hudson River School painters. He garnered considerable acclaim during his lifetime. However, following his death in 1872, his influence went largely underrecognized. Again, Michael Neumeister. It's interesting to sort of think about his history and the trajectory of the reception of landscape painting in America. Of course, he, he was regarded in his time, and then he was kind of, I don't want to say forgotten, but um, there was a period in American history where he was not looked at so much mm-hmm. uh, in the 20th century. And I think the impulse among art historians is to say, well, it was probably to do with the fact that he was African-American. There could be some truth to that. Um, But I think it's probably more complicated. I think that a lot of Hudson River School painters, people stopped looking at in the 20th century. I think in the dawn of modernism really changed the way that we looked at landscape paintings in general. And Mm -hmm. they 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 began to be seen as kind of um, relics of another time which I suppose they are. Um, And, you know, you look at Duncanson's paintings differently than a lot of his colleagues because one doesn't read into them the same kind of uh, propagandistic kind of westward expansion ethos that might be present in some of the other painters, right? But that's just sort of one lens of looking at them. I think all of their work is kind of really complicated. There's some real environmental concerns. Um, in, in works by Thomas Cole. And there's, you know, other concerns, other artists um, looking at land in different ways and maybe not in very nice ways sometimes and maybe not in ways that we appreciate or can relate to in the 21st century. Uh, but I think as historical teaching tools and, of course, as kind of incredible compositions, uh, they're very much worth looking at and studying again and again. The representation of the American landscape is intricate and subjective, influenced by regionalism, identity, class, and various factors that shape the perceptions of our surroundings. 
With this in mind, the organizers of Unsettled have deliberately worked towards fostering inclusivity in their curatorial approach. Laura Leonard, ArtBridge's project coordinator and curatorial researcher at the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum of Art, discusses the advantages of adopting a broader perspective. How could we possibly define what it means to have like American identity or American culture? Because like the, there's no one definition. And so one of the things that's always fascinated me is like, since the establishment of the United States of America, we've always been seeking this individual national identity. And so, you know, it started with the Hudson River School, like that era in visual art, but long before it was in literature and like travel books and like what the, you know, middle class white people were doing for their vacations and like depictions of New England. But really those people like weren't even necessarily born in the United States. And throughout history, some of our really wonderful American artists that we consider American artists are, you know, they have a lot of different nationalities and a lot of different backgrounds. So like one of the ideas is like what, how you can't define it. And I think that's a really beautiful thing, but like there's always been this search for like this collective American national identity. But um, I think it's really awesome to highlight the regional identities and like everybody's backgrounds and histories and um, each individual brings something new to the table. And our artists really show that in this exhibition. So it's, you know, putting together works from four different collections over the course of 200 years, which is a really long span of time. And really thinking about like our nation's history and whose voices have historically been highlighted versus who hasn't. Each institution loaned objects that are like regionally significant too. So we have, um, like some artworks from the Penland School of Craft in Western North Carolina. And we have the Catawba Pottery from your museum and a three panel chest from Plymouth, Massachusetts from the 1700s here too. So it's like, we're really talking about this um, evolution of art and like the way that people relate to the world around them and how they interpret it. We have this lovely piece by Dan Friday that the Wadsworth acquired last year. And he is a contemporary glass artist, um, and he his heritage is Coast Salish, and it's um, an ethno linguistic group located in um, Washington State and British Columbia, Canada. So they're around like the Puget Sound. They're really known for their weaving and these baskets that are like really intricate. So they use them for like cooking and um, gathering materials and um, it's all made from materials that they find locally. And so this is tradition has been passed down from generation to generation. And then we also have a basket from a Coast Salish weaver. And that's probably my favorite pairing in the whole exhibition because you really had this conversation between like this really traditional work and this contemporary iteration. While there are a variety of different regions represented in the exhibition, as Laura pointed out, Unsettled provided partner museums with a chance to showcase artworks and capture the character and identity of the places they call home. One example is Sven August Newt Heldner's Untitled Painting of a Swamp. Again, Stan Hackney. One of my f- kind of favorites, which was kind of almost like a, um, a later um, submission, was from our collection, um, Heldner. Um, uh, I thought that's, I think that's a really fascinating piece because again, it very, very, very much represents our region. Cause it's basically, it's a swamp and, you know, it's, it's the Delta in the swamp and which is very much, you know, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana. So this kind of just shows another region, another part of the country. Um, and it's kind of, uh, it, it's kind of weird you say swamp and people think, oh, it's not going to be very pretty, but swamps are actually quite pretty, um, mm-hmm. and can be very fascinating. Although the swamp might evoke a sense of home for Stan, it's the pink and blue shack crafted by Beverly Buchanan that transports Glenna back to the roadsides of South Carolina. Buchanan grew up here in South Carolina. She was in Orangeburg, which is not far from Columbia, and spent a lot of time uh, when she was young going on like overnight trips to more rural parts of the state. And so she has these memories of, you know, seeing these kinds of structures that are, you know, 
you know, old cabins or barns that are, you know, wooden structures that are just sort of dilapidated. And anyone who's driven anywhere in South Carolina, more than like 10 miles outside of a city, knows exactly <laughs> what we're talking about uh-huh. when, when you say that, because they're everywhere. And that's not uniquely South Carolinian. I think that speaks to the larger southeastern landscape in general. I'm sure lots of other parts of the country kind of fit that description, too. But um, it really definitely speaks to an experience that a lot of us have had here in the Southeast. And what I think is so lovely about these is that Buchanan doesn't see these shacks, uh, which she calls them, as depressing. She actually um, sees them as these symbols of resilience. And I just love that kind of spin on it. So she sees them not as, you know, oh, they're falling apart, they're crumbling, they're, you know, dilapidated. She sees, you know, these structures and all that they've been through. So if you think about that, some of these are, you know, probably 100 years old or so. They've, they've seen, you know, wind and hail and rain and maybe war, and they're still standing. She actually sees them as kind of hopeful objects that they're still here and, you know, we're still here. And um, so she sees them as these sites of uh, memory and persistence. And uh, that's why she paints them in these vibrant colors. If they were just like brown and, you know, just wood, they would feel very different. But she paints them in these beautiful, vibrant colors. And she's trying to capture, you know, the spirit of the people who made them or the people who lived in them. And uh, to me, that's just such a perfect analogy for this kind of exhibition where it's thinking about the landscape. Um, But it's thinking about it in a personal way. And it's not just all, you know, sweeping, you know, vast landscapes. Sometimes it's something that's really close to home or something that's really personal or very much of the land that it, you know, comes from. While many of the works symbolize a familiar sense of place for the cohort, Michael identifies a notable departure in the form of a European landscape entitled Coast Seen on the Mediterranean by Washington Alston a painting that presents a unique narrative about the lives of early American artists. The work in our exhibition is actually an Italianate landscape, right? It's, it's not, the subject matter is not American at all, um, which would have kind of been par for the course for, you know, a, a painter in the really early 19th century um, traveling to Europe and painting European things. Uh, but I think you really get that luminous sense of the quality of light uh, reflecting on that coast scene. You know, we, we talked about the differences in landscape and views and scenery between Europe and America and how that really differentiated the Hudson River School and made it unique. Well, also, I think when I look at the coast scene on the Mediterranean and I see that really unique quality of light, I think, you know, South Carolina's got a really interesting quality of light, too. That mm-hmm. kind of, mm-hmm. you know, as someone who's not from here, I'm still kind of struck by it all the time. Um, and I wonder if that was in Austin's head. And I wonder if that influenced him at all. Because, I mean, you know, his, from his perch as a kid growing up basically on the coast, out in, in Merle's Inlet, and, and probably having these wonderful, expansive views and vistas. Um, surely that inspired him as an artist. Alston's painting isn't the only work on view spanning beyond the borders of the U.S. Again, Aaron Monroe. We have a wonderful Frederick Church view of mountains in Ecuador that is hanging next to the Montgomery Museum's uh, Marsden Hartley view in Cuernavaca, Mexico. And it is very deeply thought out why those two works are hanging next to each other. Um, They're in the section called Expanding Horizons. It takes this concept of American art out of New England, first of all, Um, also looking south to our borders and Central and Latin American um, experiences. And they're similarly composed but they're also demonstrating a kind of uh, expansive view of quote unquote American identity. So I love that pairing in the next to last section called semi-natural. The Albert Bierstadt painting, which is view in Yosemite, hangs adjacent to a radically different work in its style um, because it's from the 2000s painting by Tom McGrath, which is essentially a view from Mulholland Drive of downtown Los Angeles. And it's abstracted enough that that isn't necessarily obvious what you're seeing until you perhaps read the title. But it has the same kind of overwhelming sort of 
inspiration from the landscape. Mm -hmm. It happens to be urban sprawl and city lights and that grid. But McGrath is someone who actually cites the work of Bierstadt as being in mind this kind of sublime, sort of overwhelming experience of our surroundings. And I, I see that connectivity. It'll be interesting to see how that sits with visitors because they're they're spread apart by 200 years and um, but seen within kind of the same vantage point. Throughout this podcast, we've explored the perspectives of the artists behind these works and the museums that curated them. However, as Aaron emphasizes, it's crucial to also consider the perspective of another vital stakeholder in this exhibition, the audience. Each person who views this exhibition will bring their own ideas of what an American identity means to the conversation, a conversation that will continue to evolve as this exhibition travels from location to location, all thanks to the generosity of the Art Bridges Foundation. We're so grateful for the support of Art Bridges and, and working with the Wadsworth Athenaeum to do this from the perspective of someone who's worked in the field for a really long time. I felt for the last decade, at least, that this is a point of real transition for museums, especially art museums, to find relationships that can build cooperation and consortia like this to make the sharing of art possible. I think their basic fundamental principle or idea, you know, of bringing art to communities outside of major city institutions um, that would not otherwise have an opportunity to see great art. They are really um, coming up to the plate and really helping with that. Having that ability to have these collaborative relationships with other organizations to kind of pool our collections because we all have, you know, high points and low points. Um, and so that, it, that allows for that trade that is often very, very difficult. I think a real point of achievement is that the conversations on sort of a, a human level of curator to curator or um, educator to educator have been really beneficial. And it's sort of allowed a kind of reset of what we think about and talk about when it comes to American art. And it was very eye opening to see the abundance of possibilities that come together when you bring objects that don't necessarily live together. What are the juxtapositions? What are the conversations? And that we're all still learning about history, about our own history, our sense of identity. It's really an exhibition I hope resonates in some way with everyone that comes through, but also the museums that have participated have been fantastic and we're, we've, we've learned a lot in the process. And I think that as a kind of personal accomplishment is really exciting. Yeah, I can't wait to see what we continue to do. I think this partnership is wonderful and I think every iteration of the show is going to be unique. I hope that a lot of people get to see these artworks because it's so special to like have all of these works together specifically. I mean, you're getting a huge variety of artists that some of them haven't ever been together before. So I just think it's really special. Thanks for joining us today on the Unsettled Podcast, a special presentation of the American South Consortium, formed by the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum of Art as part of the Art Bridges Cohort Program. Today's guests were Aaron Monroe, Laura Leonard, Glenna Barlow, Michael Neumeister, Margaret Lynn Osfeld, Emily Stewart Thomas, John Carfagno, and Stan Hackney. Be sure to see the exhibition Unsettled on view through April 14th at the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts or when it opens at any of our other partner institutions later this year. Until next time, I'm Drew Barron. Thanks for listening.